It's a pleasure to introduce Howard Marks. I think everybody knows him. Please give a round of applause to welcome him. So on behalf of my firm, ValueQuest, and the CFU Society, I welcome Howard to, uh, to be here with us and to speak to all of you. Um, it's a privilege and honor to have you here, Howard. And I know he's very excited because uh, I last spoke to him about, first time when I spoke to him about this event, it was in September of 2016 in New York. And then um, in December, Howard was very kind and he invited Parish and me to have a lunch, private lunch with Charlie Munger. That's when again he talked about 2nd March. So he's very excited about the date and the event uh, and, the, and the talk that he wants to give to all of us. Uh, of course, he needs no introduction to this audience. Um, he's a role model for, I think, many of us, certainly for me and, and for Parish, for Namit as well. Um, for many of us, you know, we, we know that for us, for many of us over here, this will be the most important thing for, for a long time, <laughs> to, to have this interaction. Um, I know many people have come. Uh, we have a full house, so thank you for coming here. We have people, Howard, come from all over the country. There, there is somebody who has come from Dubai. Uh, there's um, somebody who's come from Singapore. And uh, there is a guy who wrote to me from Bangalore. I, I wrote to him, Kimi, he's around. Kimi, are you there? Yeah, there he is. So I, I, Kimi is, you know, is a big fan of yours, uh, and I uh, and I wrote to him asking him whether he would like to come down. And here is what he wrote: Are you kidding me? I will of course be there. My feeling is similar to that of an enthusiastic student of a famous National Geographic photographer on being asked if he was willing to join him in an expedition. His reaction: I will swim through lava to make it happen. <laughs> So I told Kimi to take a flight instead. And <laughs> <laughs> so you have a huge fan following in India, Howard, and, um, uh, and of course I'm a big fan of yours. Um, as a teacher and practitioner of value investing, I've learned so much from you. And I know this is about you, not about me, but I can't resist telling my, uh, my, my community here, uh, the value investing community, about two things that I've learned from you. And um, the lesson number one is second level thinking. It's the, it's the first chapter in, in Howard's book, his earlier book. There's another one coming, more about that soon. And in that chapter, as I read through the chapter, it kind of blew me away. And let me give you some examples. So there was this company, and I'm not going to name companies, but the idea is that you have to think beyond. Uh, you have to uh, think about the consequences. You have to think about second order effects. And uh, in a, in a pari mutual system of a stock market, when you're betting against uh, uh, each other, not against the house, the behavior of other people will change the odds. And there are situations when bad news could actually be good news. So the first order effect, which many people focus on, which generally Mr. Market focuses on, is that if there is something which is bad about a company, the market will bring down the valuation of that company but uh, it may actually make it more attractive because the bad news may not be so bad after all. It might actually make the stock far more attractive and that's of course what value investing is all about. The second lesson that I have, uh, which I learned from Howard was from his 2001 memo and that was titled, you, can't, you cannot predict but you can repair. And uh, I kind of slightly modified that, sorry about that, I just slightly modified it to, you can't predict but you can protect. And that, of course, is the philosophy uh, that Parish and I follow when you think about portfolio construction. And it kind of liberates you because when you read through that chapter, it tells you that you don't have to worry about making a lot of predictions because there are a whole lot of things which are basically unpredictable. But you can protect yourself from those things. And the way to do that is to have a thoughtful portfolio construction methodology. So just as an illustration, there are businesses that we love. We've invested in them, and they may be in different industries. But they may have something in common, and that common thing could be, for example, they're all exporters. So they all have, uh, let's say, uh, dollar earnings but rupee cost, and therefore clearly there is the risk of currency appreciation. If Indian currency appreciates, it may be a low probability situation, but, uh, and nobody knows where rupee is headed. But one can think about the consequences of, uh, of that situation arising, and then 
whether those consequences are acceptable to you or not. And then handle that at the portfolio construction level. And that's again the whole thing about portfolio construction for us, for, for I think for everybody who is a thoughtful portfolio constructor, is that risk tends to get aggregated in many ways. And you have to think thoughtfully about that. And one way to do that is to follow what, what, what Howard has written about you can't predict, but you can prepare. I could go on and on, but uh, I will stop here. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to welcome Howard Marks. So, so while the, the presentation comes, maybe we will have some question and answers. You know, we, what we did was, Howard, we, uh, in anticipation of your visit here, we sent out mails to in, invitations to so many people, and we asked them to send us questions, just like happens in the Berkshire meeting. And we received dozens and dozens of questions. And we have shortlisted some questions, which we think are, are good, excellent quality questions. And you know, I'm going to ask uh, Navneet and Paresh to ask you some of those questions. We'll start from there, That's a good idea. and then when we have the presentation coming in. Very good. Start. First of all, before it starts, I want to apologize for keeping you waiting. And uh, as Sanjay said, we did have uh, technical difficulties, although I think that over-dignifies the situation. Uh, we, just, we just had a failure to uh, transmit the uh, presentation. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm very glad to be here today. Uh, this is my first visit to India. Um, it was uh, actually a vacation trip. And I've been here, oh, uh, it'll be two weeks tomorrow. Uh, and I just want to tell you, I've had a wonderful time traveling throughout the country and uh, getting to know the people and seeing the beauty. Um, and it's uh, inspirational. Um, anyway, uh, thank you for waiting for me and thank you for coming today. Now, Nadeep, you have some uh, questions? Or should Paresh start? Paresh should start, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sanjay. Thank you, Howard, for being here. Uh, I think for many of us, uh, it's very exciting to listen and Let me to just say one more thing. In the media industry in the United States, this is the point where they do this. They go, they, the, the director, does it, which means stretch it out. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> but uh, let me jump into the question. You know, in, in one of your memos, it's not easy. You wrote about the Nifty 50. Uh, you wrote that the price you pay does matter. And you, know, uh, you said the price you pay does matter. Uh, there is a contrary view. Uh, and you know, uh, Jeremy Siegel has said in his book uh, that even an arbitrary selection of great companies uh, at any price, even at the highest peak point, held out for 25 years, will do better. Uh, than you know, uh, average companies. How do you reconcile both the views? It's a big question. Um, I think that uh, the title for Mr. Siegel is academician. In other words, he looks at it in academically. And I don't think he's ever tried to hold the stock for 25 years if, <laughs> if, 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 after it went down 80% in the first year. And most of us have had that experience. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I cut my teeth by uh, joining the equity research department of Citibank in 1968. And the bank practiced something called Nifty 50 investing. And it invested in the best and 50 fastest growing companies in America. And these were companies where it was believed that nothing could go wrong. So as Professor Siegel would say, any price was OK. Didn't matter. If the price was a little high, you'd grow into it. So if you were smart enough to invest in Merck, Lilly, Avon, Coke, uh, Texas Instruments, Hewlett Packard, uh, and uh, that ilk of companies in 68, and you were smart enough to hold those stocks for five years, you lost 80 to 90% of your money. And, and I would be shocked, actually, to find that, I mean, I haven't done the work, but I'd be surprised to, to, to find that you have an attractive rate of return to today. The other thing is that, as I said, these were companies where it was believed that nothing could ever go wrong. Well, the list included Xerox, IBM, Polaroid, Kodak, and AIG. And all of those companies 
either went bankrupt or flirted with bankruptcy. So, you know, when it's, it's, it's cavalier to say a great company. These were companies that everybody thought were great in 1968. Nobody thinks they're great today. If you had uh, stayed with those stocks from 68 to today, you wouldn't have anything uh, to show for it as a record. So I, I actually feel that, that uh, joining City in 68 and being part of, of the Nifty 50 was a very instructive lesson. It was the first investment lesson in my life. Now, it, one very important thing is you learn nothing from success. You only learn from failure. And uh, one of the things I like to say is that experience is what you got when you didn't get what you wanted. And so I was very fortunate to learn a painful lesson early. You invest in the best companies in America and you lose almost all your money. Now, 10 years later, I joined, I was asked to start a portfolio of high yield bonds. They used to call them junk bonds. Now I'm dealing with the worst companies in America. So what I learned from the combination of these two things is that investing is not a matter of what you buy, it's what you pay. Investing is not a matter of buying good things, but buying things well. And you have to understand the difference between buying good things and buying things well. And I think that's what we've been able to do. And my whole career since 78, the last 40 years, has been based on pretty much buying assets that were out of favor. Because you know, when you buy assets everybody hates, you get better bargains. And uh, uh, so, you know, uh, I think, well, I, I could respond on the subject of Professor Siegel, but I'll leave it there. But if you, if you want to learn something, you can go back and read his book, uh, Stocks for the Long Run. It's instructive, not necessarily in a good way. <laughs> good, thank you. Okay, again, with apologies, uh, this, is a, uh, this is a presentation called The Truth About Investing. And uh, I hope that it will uh, be of value to you. Most investors cannot see the macro future better than anybody else. The history of, oh, the, the tables? The record of forecasters is not great, and I don't believe, I don't believe that anybody has made a great career by being right repeatedly about the direction of interest rates, currencies, commodity prices, the, the economy, or even guessing the direction of the market. Uh, and, I, you know, I take this quote from John Kenneth Galbraith, an American economist who passed away a few years ago. He said, we have two kinds of forecasters, the ones who don't know, and the ones who don't know they don't know. And I think this is extremely important to realize. And, and it's not just a joke, because you must, realize, you must decide which are you. Are you going to bet your career and your performance on, on predictions about the macro, or are you not? And the choice is important in terms of how you're going to operate. Most people, well, I'll probably say that here, most investors act as if they can see the future. Either they think they can, some do, or they think they have to, try to, in order to be a success in the investment business. Now, in my opinion, the dangerous thing is if it turns out that they can't, as is usually the case. And you see, very few people feel that they can go to their clients. The client says, well, what do you think oil's going to do next month? And very few people have the nerve to say, I don't know. But if they don't know, and I think they don't know, then they should say so. And I think that that's how you build integrity with your clients. Amos Tversky, there's a book out now, Thinking Slow and Fast. Have you read that? By Daniel Kahneman, a behaviorist. Tversky was his partner, professor at Stanford. And he said, it's frightening to think you may not know something, but more frightening to think that, by and large, the world is run by people who have faith that they know exactly what's going on. 
you know, there are things that are unknowable. And if the people who are running the show think they know the unknowable, then that's how you get into trouble. Mark Twain said, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for certain that just ain't true. You know, if, if you start with, I don't know, then you're unlikely to act so boldly as to get into trouble. But if you start with, I know, you may make a bold bet. And if it turns out you didn't know, you lose a lot of money. So I think it's very, very important to make that distinction. Now, it is true that once in a while, someone gets famous for a startlingly accurate forecast. It usually turns out, in my opinion, to have been luck and can't be repeated. And our business is full of people who got famous for being right once in a row. You know, there was a guy named Joe Granville who made a prediction in, I think it was 87, that uh, such and such would happen, a market would fall. It did fall. He got famous, you know, on all the shows in the newspaper. His next fo correct forecast was in uh, 2007. So the point is the record is not good. And we, before we put our stock in anybody, we have to understand whether their success is repeatable. Now, one of the main reasons why the future is not knowable is randomness. Events often fail to materialize as we think they should. Improbable things happen all the time. Things that should happen fail to happen all the time. We have to accept this. This is the result of randomness. Investors who have made seemingly logical decisions lose money all the time. Idiots uh, profit from unforeseeable windfalls all the time. Nothing is more common than investors who were right for the wrong reason. And we all have had opportunities to say we had it right. We just were unlucky. Investors who would be wise to accept that they cannot see the future. And they should restrict themselves to doing things which are within their power. Now, I talk about knowing the knowable. That's what I try to tell our colleagues. You can know more than the others about companies and industries and securities if you work very hard and if they are not fully followed. This is the knowable. You can control your emotion. That's very important, and I'll touch on that. And you can behave in a contrarian and countercyclical manner. I think these are the keys to success in the investment business, not predictions of the macro future. Now, having said that, while we never know where we're going, macro-wise, market direction-wise, we should have a good sense of where we are. I think this is very important. And it is possible to enhance your investment results by making tactical decisions suited to the market climate. Is this a contradiction in terms? I think not. I think we can make decisions not based on what we think is going to happen in the future, but based on what's happening today. That's the distinction. And in my opinion, the most important choice that any investor can make in the intermediate term is whether to be aggressive or defensive. Not whether it's stocks or bonds, not whether it's US or foreign, not whether it's developed world or emerging, not big or small, not risky or safe. But is this a good time to be aggressive? Or is this a more important to, time to be defensive? Uh, and I believe that this decision can be made on the basis of observations regarding current conditions. They do not require guesswork about the future. I've written whole memos in which I say uh, not one word about the future. Now. As I was saying earlier during, in answer to uh, Paresh's question, superior results do not come from buying high quality assets, but from buying assets regardless of quality for less than their worth. That is the most dependable way to, to, for, to success as an investor. And it is essential, as I said, to understand the difference. A low purchase price not only creates the opportunity for gain, but it also limits the downside risk. So you can enhance return and reduce risk by buying assets where the value is solid and uh, the price is low. The bigger the discount, the greater the margin of safety. And uh, that is something that is extremely desirable to people who want to control the risk in their portfolios. Now, sometimes there are plentiful opportunities for unusual return with less than commensurate risk like right after the meltdown of Lehman Brothers. 
And sometimes the opportunities are few and risky. It's important to wait patiently for the former. You should not act the same regardless of the market environment. You should turn aggressive when there are bargains and defensive when everything is high. It seems pretty obvious. And when there's nothing clever to do, it's a mistake to try to be clever. You know, it's as simple as that. There aren't, uh, investment opportunities are not equally distributed over time. And so you should act differently, differently at different times depending on the climate. The price of a security at a given point in time reflects the consensus value of all investors regarding uh, it, it, what it's worth. Some people say, I'll sell at 48. Some people say, I'll borrow at 48. It, it sells at 48. Nobody runs in to buy it too much. They think 48 is fair. Nobody wants to sell it too much. It stays at 48. That's the consensus. Now, the big gains arise when the consensus turns out to have underestimated reality or misestimated reality. And the, to be able to take advantage of such divergencies, you have to think in a way that departs from consensus. You have to think different, and you have to think better. It's clear, or it should be clear, that if you think the same as everybody else, you'll act the same as everybody else. And if you act the same as everybody else, you'll perform the same as everybody else. Now, everybody in this room wants to outperform. If we, if we don't outperform, we'll be put out of work by an index fund. We have to outperform. And clearly, as, as uh, Sanjay was saying, the key to outperformance is to think different and better. Different is not sufficient. It has to be different and better. Now, I, I call this second level thinking or variant perception. My son, who Sanjay and Paresh know well, when he was a student in college studying finance, he would come to me. He'd say, Dad, we should buy Ford because they've come out with a great new Mustang. And I'm, my question to him, which was intended to be instructional, was always the same. Who doesn't know that? If you are investing on the basis of a fact that everybody knows, number one, it can't possibly constitute an advantage. And number two, it can't possibly have been omitted from the price. So you have to have some knowledge that is different from that of others. The challenge is that most of the time, the consensus is about right. So if you make a habit, if you make a lifetime of, of having predictions which are different, you'll make a lot of mistakes. You have to be different and better, and that's hard. Superior performance does not come from being right, but from being more right than the consensus. That's important. You can be right about something and perform average if everybody else is right too. You predict $3 in earnings per share, earnings come in at $3, stock doesn't move. Because everybody predicted $3. Or you can be wrong and outperform if everybody else is wrong, more wrong. You predict $2.50, it comes in at $3, stock goes up. Why? Because everybody else predicted $2. You were less wrong. So being right is not a criterion, and being right is not necessarily profitable. Just more right than others. As I said here, anytime you think you know something others don't, you should examine the basis. Who doesn't know that? Why should I be privy to exceptional information or insight? You have to ask yourself, how do I know this? Nobody else knows it. Am I really that smart, or am I just wrong? Am I certain I'm right and that everyone else is wrong? Mightn't it be the opposite? It's not, if it's the result of advice from someone else, you must say to yourself, well, why would anybody possibly give me potentially valuable information? Think about it. In this day and age, given the availability of derivatives, correct forecasts are of, of infinite value. So why should the guy on TV give them away? And why should he give them to you? It's really as simple as that. And by the way, why is he still working for a living if he knows what the future holds? You know, I'm always skeptical of the people who will tell you the future for $5. Because don't they have something better to do with their time? Over the last few decades, investors' frameworks have shrunk. They've become obsessed with quarterly returns. 
And in fact, technology now enables them to become distracted by returns on a daily basis and even a minute to minute basis. And people talk about what they're up today or down on the week. And it's silly and it's a distraction. And that's not what matters at all. And as a consequence, one way to gain an advantage over others is by ignoring the noise that is created by the manic swings of opinion from day to day and week to week and by focusing on the things that matter in the long term. Is it better to be right in the long, short term but wrong in the long term or vice versa? Clearly, the only thing that matters is being right in the long run. And we can all live with some failures in the short run in the interest of doing so. It isn't the inability to see the future that cripples most efforts at, in, at investing. More often, it is emotion. Emotion is one of our great enemies. Investors swing like pendulums between fear and greed, and between euphoria and depression, and between credulousness and skepticism, and between being risk tolerant and being risk averse. Usually, they swing in the wrong direction. They warm to things after they have risen, because they're impressed and because they want to chase, and they, and they shun them after they fall. And this is human nature, and this is really one of the, the greatest uh, enemies. And I'll just add that, it, you know, when the economy is doing well and the company's reporting good results and the price is rising, everybody gets excited, and the higher the price goes, the more they want to buy. That's what makes tops. That's what makes the market rise. And what is a top? The top is the moment when the last potential buyer buys. The buying power has been exhausted. Then eventually, of course, the economy does less well. The company reports bad earnings. The stock price starts to fall, fall, fall. And when it gets down here, people become depressed. And they, they want to sell. Their motivation for selling increases as the stock price goes lower. In other words, buy high, sell low. My guess is everybody in this room's mother told them, buy low, sell high. So that can't possibly be right. Most investors be behave pro-cyclically, not counter-cyclically, and it is to their detriment. I've dis already described the process, and it is essential to act counter-cyclically. Not easy, but essential. Cyclical ups and downs do not go on forever, but at extremes, the investors act as if they will. You know. Uh, when I was uh, very young, I was given the three stages of a bull market. This was about 1972. Uh, one of my older colleagues told me this. He said that in the first stage of a bull market, only a few exceptional people begin to realize that there can be improvement. In the second stage, most people believe that improvement is actually taking place. And in the third stage, everybody thinks that things can only get better forever. The attractiveness of a stock's price or any securities price is dependent on how much optimism there is in the price. When people are optimism, prices are high. When people are pessimistic, prices are low. So obviously, in the first stage, there is no optimism. That's the great time to buy. In the last stage, there's only optimism. That's a great time to sell. But of course, few people buy in the first stage. Most people buy in the last stage. Warren Buffett says, first the innovator, then the imitator, then the idiot. And the way I put it is that what the wise man does in the beginning, the fool does in the end. And this is one of the very, very most important lessons in investing. Now. It, it, closely related to countercyclical behavior is contrarian behavior. You must, und, uh, you must do the opposite of what others do at the extremes because the, obviously the, the extremes represent danger. They represent the opportunity to sell high, buy high and the opportunity to sell low. That's what most people are doing. You must do the opposite. Markets are riskiest when there is widespread belief that there's no risk. That's the riskiest thing in the world. This makes investors feel that it's safe to do risky things. In the spring of 07, there were actually articles in the paper saying that there's no more risk. Because, number one, um, the Fed has the situation under control, and 
they'll just squirt in a little more liquidity if things soften. Number two, um, there's a constant flow of money back to the developed world from China and the oil producers, which will keep assets aloft. And number three, Wall Street has sliced and diced risk so finely and spread it out so finely that it's essentially gone. And of course, it was the belief that the world was free of risk in the spring of 07 that brought, brought on the crisis uh, and brought it to a head. Um, we must sell when others are emboldened. That's tops. And we must buy when they're afraid. And Buffett says, the less prudence with which others conduct their affairs, the greater the prudence with which we must conduct our own affairs. Now, let's talk a little bit about the efficient market hypothesis. It says that thanks to the combined efforts of thousands of intelligent, informed, and motivated investors, the market price of each asset accurately reflects its underlying or intrinsic value. In other words, that the market is a weighing machine. And it's an, it's an evaluation tool. Thus, market prices are fair. And if you pay the market price, which is a fair price, you can expect a fair risk-adjusted return, no more, no less. This is the reason for the assertion of the academics that you can't beat the market. Now, I do not believe that all markets are efficient. And I don't believe that any markets are 100% efficient. But I do believe that the concept of market efficiency must not be ignored. You can know something. It's even possible to know more than others. But the going in presumption should be that everybody is well informed. And if you think you know something they don't, you should be able to express the reason for that. It, it's, it's not easy. They're trying just as hard as you are. In, in more developed markets, efficiency reduces the frequency and magnitude of opportunities to outthink the consensus and identify mispricings or inefficiency. We talked before about having a knowledge advantage, about second level thinking. So you think you know something about a company that the, that the others don't. But if you think about it, it is the goal of the SEC, for example, to make sure that everybody has the same information. People who have too much special information are taken to court as inside traders. So given rule FD and the emphasis on, on the equal dissemination of information, how do you get an advantage? Uh, you should, uh, you know, it's possible, but you should always wonder why me, why now? In, and, uh, you know, when I, in 1978, when I was done with equity research, at Citibank, and they said, what do you want to do next? I said, I'll do anything except spend the rest of my life choosing between Merck and Lilly. You know, everybody knows everything there is to know about Merck and Lilly, or everything that's legally available. And how could I get an edge? Uh, this is market efficiency. Now, we all look for market inefficiencies, with what I call mistakes. Pricing mistakes. If inefficiency is a fancy word, mistake is a simple word. Times when the price is wrong. It helps to get to a market early before it becomes understood and popular and respectable. The trouble is pretty much all markets are known now. Now, what I found in my career is that there's nothing like playing in an easy game, an inefficient asset class. When I started with high yield bonds in 78, when I started with distressed debt in 88, even when I started with emerging markets in 98, they were not fully understood and embraced by the investment community. And it's far more easy to do that than to be the smartest person in a game that everybody understands and in, is eager to play. Uh, and, and, and I gave you the quotes before from, from uh, Buffett. Now, another thing that's important to know about investing is that the behavior of participants alters the landscape. And this is what George Soros calls reflexivity. Now, if you go out and play golf every Saturday, eventually you figure out on your golf course that if you hit the ball over here, it rolls into the cup. But if you hit it over here, it rolls into the water. So over time, you learn to put it here. There's only one reason why that works. The golf course doesn't play back. The golf course doesn't say, I'm going to take care of this guy and go like this. But in the markets, they do. If people find a bargain and they buy it,
that raises the price until it's not a bargain, and so forth. Um, so, as I say here, when investors uh, who bought something early show big gains, others rush in and bid it up. It makes no sense to assume that a market that offered bargains in the past will also always do so in the future. And you know, the one thing we can't ever do is extrapolate asset class returns. To be a successful investor, you have to have a philosophy and a process you believe in and you can stick to even when the times get tough. This is very important. The, if you don't have uh, courage of your convictions and patience and, and toughness, you can't be an investor because you'll constantly be driven to fall in line with the uh, consensus by buying at the top and selling at the bottom. But it's important to note that no approach will allow you to profit from all kinds of opportunities or in, or in all environments. You have to be willing not to participate in everything that goes up, only the things that fit your approach. Now, in, in uh, 99, in the tech boom, Buffett did not buy grow technology. And in, in the first quarter of uh, 2000, for any of you who were around, you'll recall, everybody said, well, that's it for Buffett. He's past his prime. He's too old. 17 years ago, he was only 70. They said, too old. You know? But the point is, he, he said, I don't do tech. I don't understand it. And uh, it's not for me. I'm going to sit it out. The truth is, however, that one of the most corrosive of all the difficult human emotions is the feeling of having to sit by and watch other people make money. Nobody likes that. And so th what happens is a process that I call capitulation. You know, that you don't like it at 60, you don't like it at 80, you don't like it at 100, but when it hits 150, you say, okay, I'll get on board. And of course, that's usually closer to the top than it was to the bottom. And to be a disciplined investor, you have to be willing to stand by and watch while other people make money that you passed on. You don't have to invest in everything. You don't have to catch every trend. You should invest within yourself in the things you know about and stick to it. And among other things, success has, in my opinion, I, I, one of my sayings is that success is not good for most people. And we all know successful people. We all know people who have been successful. It makes them think they're smart. It makes them think if they're smart, they must be able to do everything. And of course, that's a very dangerous thing. And now, that one success might have been because they were smart in one specific field, which they should stick to, or it might be because they were lucky, or some combination. But most people, when they're successful, uh, reach, a, reach a dangerous conclusion about their own ability. Every investment approach, even if skillfully applied, will run into environments for which it is ill-suited. Buy and hold. Growth stocks, value stocks, small stocks, large stocks, foreign, domestic. And that means that even the best of investors will have periods of poor performance. Nobody performs great all the time. Buffett was considered over with. Now, even if you are correct in identifying a divergence of popular opinion from eventual reality, that variant perception that I mentioned, it can take a long time for the price to converge with value and it can require something that acts as the catalyst. Underpriced does not mean going up tomorrow. Overpriced does not mean going down tomorrow. And, and we, everybody has to know that. And in order to be able to stick with an approach or decision until it proves out, which can be a long time, investors have to be able to weather periods when the results are embarrassing. This can be very difficult. Lord Keynes said, the market can remain irrational longer than you can remain solvent. That's especially true of leveraged investors. That's the danger of leverage. And being too far ahead of your time, I was told back in the 70s, is indistinguishable from being wrong. So the point is, the, the more you try to be a superior investor, the more idiosyncratic positions you have to take, invariably they will be unsuccessful for a while, the worse you'll look and the, the, the greater pressures to succumb. So uh, everybody has to really invest in a way which is consistent with their personality. And for a mild-mannered person to be a big risk taker in the market is bound to lead to failure.
Now, those who invest the, the money of others, which includes most of the people in this room, rather than their own, have to worry about losing their jobs or their clients. This is a fact of life. I don't think we have to be squeamish about mentioning it. This is a fact of life. The fear of embarrassing performance can make them excessively risk averse and cause them to over diversify and shy away from bold commitments. And I wrote a memo back in 2006, I believe, and I updated it in 2014 called Dare to be Great. And it touches on these matters. But I think these are very, very important. And, uh, you know, how great will you try to be at what price in terms of safety and and even survivability. Dave Swenson runs the endowment at Yale, which is the best performing of all the university endowments in, in, uh, in America. He's had great performance for 30 years because he did a lot of private equity and a lot of venture capital, a lot of uh, private investing very, very early, uh, 30 years ago when he started. And Dave wrote a book called Pioneering Portfolio Management. And he says that establishing and maintaining an unconventional investment profile requires acceptance of, and I love this, uncomfortably idiosyncratic portfolios, which frequently appear downright imprudent in the eyes of conventional wisdom. Now, everybody says, well, yes, I am anti-cyclical. I am contrarian. I'm a second-level thinker. I reach conclusions which are different from others and better. But if you are those things, you have to do things which diverge from the consensus. You, you know, if you, li if you buy the things that the consensus thinks are great, you're unlikely to find a great bargain. Everybody else likes it too. So you have to buy the things that they don't like, which means that you will look like you're out of step. And, you know, uh, you have to be able to live with that for a long time, even with the pressure that comes from clients. And, and, and that's not a mystery. And to succeed, you have to survive. How's that for an axiom? And in particular, that means avoiding selling at the bottom. It is not enough to survive on average. You have to survive on the worst days. So you have to have a portfolio that fits with your personality and with your client's realities. Selling at the bottom, which people are often forced to do, especially if they operate on leverage, and, fail, and as a consequence, failing to participate in the subsequent recovery is, in my opinion, the cardinal sin of investing. And, you know, having a security that goes down isn't the worst thing in the world. If your analysis is right and it's going to recover, participating in a market which declines is not the worst thing in the world. Invariably, the market eventually recovers. The worst thing is to have something which goes down and sell it at the bottom because then you don't get to participate in the recovery. And then you lose two ways. You, you, you participate in the loss and you miss the gain. The ability to persevere requires consistent adherence to a well thought out approach, control over emotion, and a portfolio built to withstand declines. You have to have some combination of those three. And I always say never forget the six foot tall man who drowned crossing the stream that was five feet deep on average. It does, it's not sufficient to survive on average. The concept of averages is highly misleading. You and your clients have to survive on the worst of days. And that introduces an interesting challenge, which is how bad is the worst day going to be? We don't know. We know how bad the worst day in history was, but we don't know whether the next day will be worse. Now. Risk is an inescapable part of investing. You should not expect to make money without bearing risk. I think that's as true as, as you can get. Any approach, strategy, or investment that promises substantial gain without risk is too good to be true. And we have to accept that. But you also should not expect to make money just for bearing risk. And you know, when people look at the capital market line and it slopes like this, and you have return here and risk there, and most people draw the conclusion, Number one, that riskier assets offer higher returns, and that number two, if you want to make more money, the way to do so is to take more risk. Can't be true. Can't be true. Why not? Because if riskier assets could be counted on for higher returns, they, by definition, wouldn't be risky. 
And that's, that's the bottom line on that. I believe that controlling risk is just as important as identifying opportunities for profit. Most people, their condition is such that a desirable approach strikes a balance between offense and defense. And I go through an explanation here of American football. Anybody understand American football here? Well, I don't understand cricket. That's OK. <laughs> but in American football, the offense is on the field and has the ball, and the defense is trying to stop them. The offense has four attempts to go 10 yards. And if they go 10 yards, they get four more attempts to go 10 more yards. And if they keep moving the field, ball down the field, eventually they score. The defense tries to stop them. If the defense is successful in stopping the offense on four tries, then the referee blows the whistle, the play stops, the offense goes off the field, and they send in the defense. The defense goes off the field, they send in the offense, they get the ball, and now they have four tries to go this way. And if you think that's investing, you're crazy. Because in investing, there are no stoppages. The referee doesn't blow the whistle. You never know whether you should have the offense on the field or the defense. And you have to live with the ambiguity. And, and so as I say here, uh, well, maybe I don't say it, but the point is that investing is really more like soccer or the football they play outside the United States, where the team has to embody offense and defense. You know, you can put the, defense, the greatest defense in history on the field, and, the, and you'll uh, always hold the other team to win to one goal, but you won't score any, so you'll lose every game one nothing. You can put the world's greatest offense on the team, on the field, you'll score 10 goals, but without defense, the other guys will always have 11 and you lose every game. You have to have the balance of the two. And you have to decide for you, for your clients, for your asset class, for your business realities, which is the style for me. At Oak Tree, our style is embodied by the motto, if we avoid the losers, the winners take care of themselves. Consistent, now remember that we are primarily investors in credit. And if you buy credit, you get a contractual interest payment every six months. You don't have to have winners. All you have to have is companies that survive, and you'll get that check every six months. So the success in credit comes from purely from avoiding losers. Uh, if in the 1940 edition of Graham and Dodd, they call fixed income investing a negative art, in the sense that you succeed not by what you buy, but what you exclude from your portfolio. If you exclude the losers, you get paid on everything in your portfolio. I believe that risk has to be dealt with. I believe that's what we do at Oak Tree every day. That's what we're known for. And it, but not through quantification. I don't believe in the science of risk management. Theory accepts volatility as the indicator of risk, largely, in my opinion, because data on volatility is quantitative and machinable. And you can put it in a formula and use it in an optimizer and so forth. But people in real life don't worry about volatility and don't demand a risk premium to bear it. What they care about is the likelihood of losing money. And that's the thing that if it's commonly accepted to exist, you can get a premium for bearing. Because the likelihood of losing money cannot be quantified, no probability regarding the future can be quantified. For that reason, risk is best handled by experienced experts applying subjective, qualitative judgment that is superior. And that's really the formula in, in investing. I don't believe in scientific investing, algorithmic investing. Uh, there are no rules. People say to me, well, uh, if, if you buy something and it goes down, at what point should you sell it? There can't be a rule. Because for some assets, you should sell at 20 because it's going down 40 more. And at some, you should sell at, 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 at 30. Uh, you should hold to 30 because Maybe it's, it's going to go up from there. So there are no rules that can be successful. It all comes down to judgment. I wrote a memo, the one Sanjay mentioned, second. Uh, uh, it's not easy. Uh, a couple of years ago, it all comes down to judgment. Investing cannot be reduced in algorithm. 
Few people have demonstrated the ability to excel for long uh, via quant investing. Superior results generally require insight, judgment, and intuition. I love this quote from Einstein. Not everything that counted can be counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. There is a lot in our business which cannot be quantified with any precision, but which is extremely important nevertheless. And people get involved with data. They want to collect data. They want to have all the data, even though 99% of the data is meaningless. And I, I wrote a preface for a book called The Warren Buffett Way, called uh, What Makes Warren Buffett Warren Buffett. And one of the things I talked about is that he understands which things are important and which things are not. And he can reach quick judgments based on figuring out uh, which things are important and then figuring out uh, their implications. Now, if you want to know whether a manager has above average skill or whether you do, it's essential to observe performance over many years in bad markets as well as good. Short-term outperformance and short-term underperformance are imposters, if you quote the Rudyard Kipling poem. They say very little about the real skill of a manager, because in the short run, randomness can cause a weak manager to look good for a while, but good, good long-term results are likely to be the result of skill. Absent testing in tough times, aggressive risk-taking in an environment that turns out to be salutary can be mistaken for investment skill. The way I put it is that there are three ingredients for success, aggressiveness, timing, and skill. And if you have enough aggressiveness at the right time, you don't need that much skill. Very simple. But what Buffett says is that when the tide goes out, we find out who's been swimming naked. Only at that time. Only when uh, techniques and, and abilities are tested. And you should never confuse brains with a bull market. In order to deserve incentive fees, I don't know if anybody here gets 20% of the profits, but we do, managers have to be truly exceptional. 40 years ago, or 45 years ago, when I started to hear about carry in hedge funds, there were no private equity funds 45 years ago, distressed debt funds, etc. But I started to hear about hedge funds. There were about five or 10, and they were run by five or 10 geniuses and they had really great performance with small amounts of money. Today, there are 11,000 hedge funds, 8,000 private equity funds, distressed debt funds, real estate funds, getting carry. And I dare say that they're not all run by geniuses. But the managers, in order to get carry, should really be exceptional. And exceptional managers are the exception, not the rule. Important to recognize that. Good results will bring a manager more money to manage. That makes sense. But if, if, if the inflows are unchecked, eventually more money will bring bad performance. That's the side that our industry doesn't like to talk about. And you have to make a trade-off at some point in time. Are you willing to forego having more money in order to re retain the excellence of your performance? It should be a conscious decision. If you increase assets, that can shorten the list of potential investments large enough to make an impact. They can, it can erode, erode your abilities to be selective and agile. And it can encourage style drift, under which a manager goes into things that be, are beyond his competence in an effort to put the increased amounts of money to work. So this is a conscious trade-off, and it should be based on something that we're very brutally honest about uh, with ourselves. Not everybody beats the averages. By definition, the average investor does average before fees and costs. Expenses play a crucial part in determining the success of investing. Whatever the gross results, management fees and transaction costs subtract. And after expenses, the average investor lags the, the market averages. And of course, you know, this is what I was taught at Chicago in 1967. It took about almost 50 years for the passive investing process to really gain momentum uh, as it is today in the States. Uh, but these things were true uh, 50 years ago. The average investor does average by definition 
before fees and below average after, after fees. If you invest passively in, a, in an index fund that mirrors the average, you can be sure to capture the return of the average. Now, people often err when they think that such funds are low risk. And that's not true. Index funds eliminate the risk of underperforming the average, but if the market goes down, they guarantee that you will lose money. So nobody should think that passive uh, investing is low risk. In investing, it's very important that expectations be reasonable. Aiming too high will either require excessive risk bearing or guarantee disappointment or both. And as Peter Bernstein, who was one of the smartest guys I ever met, said, the market is not an accommodating machine. It won't give you high returns just because you want them. There has to be something in the environment and in your approach and in your skill level which will make them available. Nobody should think that investing is easy. There, and Galbraith said, there is nothing reliable to be learned about making money. If there were, study would be intense, and everyone with a positive IQ would be rich. And then as Charlie Munger told me one day, it's not supposed to be easy, and anybody who finds it easy is stupid. And that's really the greatest of all sayings, because you know, there are people who think it's so simplistic. You find a good company, you buy the stock. There's a guy on the radio uh, uh, once in a while where I uh, drive to work in California, and he says, well, if you go into a store and you like the product, buy the stock. It's that simple. Well, it can't be that simple, because if it was, everybody would, would, would do it and everybody would rich. You have to be able to figure out whether the price is fair. So those are the things I wanted to tell you today. That's everything I know about investing. And, uh, you know, a, a lot of those things are kind of brutal truths, uh, but uh, they're things I wanted to equip you with.